Hello and welcome back to the Digital Marketing Podcast. My name is Kieran Rogers. I'm Louise Crossley. And I'm Daniel Rolls. And today we are discussing SEO and AI-generated content. So this one comes from a really, really important blog that was published by Google. So let's go back. Um, Last year, so 2022, Google comes out and says that you are not allowed AI-generated content on your website. There wasn't really clear definition of that. But obviously, since then, everyone started using all these AI tools. And what we're seeing is that everyone's generating this content, but you're not really supposed to be using it on your website. And everyone was kind of like, well, does that mean we're going to get punished in the search rankings? Could we get de- de-indexed? What's, what's, the, you know, what's the risk? Then lots of people saying, well, you can't detect it anyway. Um, there are AI tools being created to detect AI-generated content, which all gets a bit meta. But, but the reality being that actually you can't even detect it anyway. So how would Google go about doing that? So we were all kind of umming and ahhing and saying, well, you shouldn't really be doing it. Maybe it's good for assisting, but it shouldn't write the whole article. And then two, three weeks ago now, Google come out and say, actually... If you're using AI tools to manipulate the search engines, yes, that's a bad thing. Okay? But good content is good content. And actually, if you use AI tools, it's absolutely fine. So they've done a complete turnaround. And that it kind of makes sense because if the AI tools have been trained to write really great content and it mm. is genuinely great content and you're using it to augment what you're doing, then why shouldn't you use it? from that point of view. It's almost like they can't stop people from using it anyway, so it's better to allow it and just police it. Well, yeah, absolutely. But also, let's bear in mind, they've got their own AI tools that do writing and they're releasing Bard really soon as well. So that would be a bit hypocritical. So we've got this really good writing tool, but you mustn't use it. (laughs) Okay, so it wouldn't make any sense at all. Um, So that's a big shift, which is a big, I would say a bit of a relief for a lot of people. I also think it's going to lead to a lot of lazy content creation. I, I, I put this up onto LinkedIn and it got loads of people going, oh, great. And loads of people tagging people in because it's obviously been a conversation. And, and this guy came out and said, yeah, I did. I built a new website, did 250 articles in a day, and they've all been indexed. And he was kind of super pleased with himself. <laughs> oh, I was like, no, 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 no. This is not the point of this. There used to be tools that would do this, that would literally just fill a WordPress blog by scraping other people's website. And you, you, you do... You are going to have problems. And the reason being is as the algorithm is more about, more about user signals, and you've spoken about this before, mm. Kieran, that actually if you create rubbish content, it's not going to get those user signals. People aren't going to dwell. They're not going mm. to scroll on it. They're going to leave your website. They're, they're going to bounce back to Google. So actually rubbish content is going to still work the way rubbish content does. Well, it, in a way, nothing's changed, is it? Like they've, they've always claimed, look, what we aim for is that, you know, really good, high quality, original content. Yeah should rank well. Now, whether that's been, you know, written by AI or written by human or written by human-AI combo, which in my experience at the moment is the best way of of, of doing this um, because there are still issues with AI getting it wrong, AI hallucinating. You know, I've had AI inserting other people and other companies' names into articles that I've been reading. It's like, wait, what? <laughs> well, we'll talk about that in a minute because yeah. we'll talk about where this data is coming yeah. from as well. Yeah. I had a, just an example of this. Yeah. I had a brilliant one the other day. I got it to write me some code. So I said, write me the Python code to be able to access the API via my website. I thought it was being quite clever. I like, <laughs> access the API by getting it to write the code for me. And it did it and I ran it and it didn't work. And I scanned the code and luckily because I can code, it went through and I could see what the problem was. And I said, no, you've done this wrong. Mm-hmm. He went, I'm really sorry for my mistake. Here's the corrected code. <laughs> and he gave me the same code. And I went, no, you've made the same mistake again. And he went, yes, no, I realized it's this particular line. I was like, and it should be like this. Yeah, here's the code. <laughs> and it was wrong again. And I, I got into this, I probably lost half an hour of my life <laughs> debating with the AI. Yeah. Um, but it kept getting wrong. Why do you keep getting it wrong? And it was it got more and more apologetic as it went through. Oh. And, and in the end, I gave up and I wrote the code myself because I needed a solution. So um, it's not infallible. I think that's absolutely, that's <laughs> yes. absolutely right. So let, let's, let's come back to that, that thing about how this data, where this data is coming from, how they're yeah. training the AI in a moment. But there are some tools the um this this is kind of being integrated into everything at the moment so talk us through where you think the good tools are at the moment and, and what you're uh, using so do you know what? a lot of this is using older technology older techniques but incorporating it with you know the 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 ai models yeah. um and for a long time i've been fascinated by a thing called tfidf yes 
which stands for Term Frequency Inverse Document Frequency. And it's, uh, it's the quite, yeah, yeah, it's so snappy. Um, it's, it's, it's marketing, but it's not a full, it's like three letter acronym. What's yeah, going right. on? It's it's too many acronym. letters, too many letters, can't get my head around it. Um, but what, I mean, that's that's a very old technique. It was used by a lot of li- like quite old library systems back in the 80s where, you know, you look at how many times a particular phrase is mentioned within a document and then that gives it a score and that gives it a relevancy for certain types of topic. Right. You know, fast forward like, 40, 50 years, um, and these things are still being used. Now, Google have come out and said that we don't use that. No, but they use something similar, like an advanced version of that, I'm sure, like because it, it just makes sense if you're doing anything that's keyword um, kind of driven. And what a lot of the AI um, connected SEO tools now do is they leverage on you know, AI's ability to go out and literally analyze, okay, give me a subject. Um, so let's say we were writing about SEO, okay? Um, so we want we want to go away, go away and find all the top 100 pages that, that do rank on Google and do a, you know, TFIDF um, analysis of yeah, those right. pages. And what you get is, you know, and you've seen this in lots of tools. I know um, SEM Rush um, have a tool. Do, right? do, 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 Surfer SEO, I, I really love it. I really, really do love it. If you haven't checked it out, We've definitely mentioned it before on the podcast, but I think it's incredibly powerful. Plugs into Jasper, it, because it plugs into Jasper. But actually, they've they've just enabled you to plug it into SEM Rush. So, mm. it, uh, like that, that's amazing Seamless itself. Experience. And I haven't played with that integration, but it'll be doing similar things to what it's doing with with, with Jasper. And it enables you to literally get AI's a, a, like look around the keyword landscape to give you input on well, well what should you have? And it'll do things like it'll recommend top. Um, subheadlines mm. that you should have in there. Where is it getting that information from? Well, it's looking at common ones that are appearing everywhere on the, the, the options that, that rank. And actually what it does is it gives you a, a lovely simple score out of 100 for how hot to trot your content is. Um, now, it's very much aiming at whatever key phrase you've gone after. So, you know, you have to do your keyword research, but a lot of the tools are bringing in keyword research tools. So you instantly know, you know, what phrases have got the most traffic around them. And it just helps you get your head around it. And actually, in quite a short space of time, optimizing the content. So I'm using the tool to augment my knowledge of the right. keyword landscape, optimize stuff. The golden rule when you're doing this is not to just shove random headlines in there. Sometimes it'll highlight, oh, gosh, there's a whole subcategory we've missed out. We need to expand the, the copy. And the AI tools can help you draft a first draft with that. But again, I would always get them checked by a subject expert mm. to make sure that it's high quality Yeah, you can't content. be using these tools if you don't you know the subject. Can't. It doesn't you really, work. really, really can't. Let, let me give you an example. What we've been doing is going through, and I've started to work through this process of looking at what's ranking really well already mm. and saying, how am I going to do it better? Mm. And I will look at it and I'll run the tour and go, oh, I haven't talked about those three topics. Right, I could add something and I could make this a bit more in-depth and interesting mm-hmm. and a bit more well-rounded. But I've been using this for offline writing stuff. Mm-hmm. So if I've been writing a report for a couple of business publications, it helps me go through. When I bullet point things up, the way I write, and I've written a lot in terms of, I did that project last year, it was called to a million words. And, and it's like, it, the way I always write things is you bullet point it. Mm. And then you sub-bullet it and you sub-bullet it and you suddenly you're just writing 200 words in each of the sub-bullets mm-hmm. and it mm-hmm. becomes so much more um, achievable because it's, it's looking at a blank page is overwhelming. Mm-hmm. I mean, you've always talked to me about this yeah, as it well. Yeah, it is. And, it, and actually breaking it down. And what this helps you do is you start doing it and it gives you all the bullets. And you're oh, that would be a good idea. Yeah, I could put that in there. And then I will rearrange it and then I'll start to fill it out and then it will give me other sub-ideas. Yeah. And that works quite nicely. The, the key to this, and Google have stated this, is they're after high-quality original content. Mm. And that's its weak point at the moment. It's not great at doing like you can read an article written by AI and you're never going to go, oh, my goodness, that's amazing. That's just blown my mind. No, it's not because you've read it everywhere before. And that, that Seth Godin, we, we right, should link to Seth, to yeah, in. we should link to Seth Godin's recent post about this because I thought it was genius and a really great way of thinking about this. I'm going to argue with you about this. Bit. Oh, yeah, great. So what Seth came out and said, um, Seth, if you're listening, I apologise. I'm going to paraphrase horribly <laughs> here, but like for all credit to you because it really woke, awoke a whole new kind of angle of the debate in my mind. He said, look, you, you would never drive a car simply by looking through the rear view mirror. And that, in a way, when you think about, you know, these language models and how these systems have been trained, they've been trained on tons of data yeah. that exists actually in the past. Yep. Like it's not looking at future data. It can't, doesn't exist yet. So it's using that to, to, to model out all of this, this knowledge and all of this in, intelligence. 
And, and his angle was very much that you still need your strategists because they've got a far greater cap capability than the AI does to imagine future scenarios rather than base everything on what's gone before or rules. And so there's certain areas where it can excel, but go on, Daniel, come on, hit me with it. Right. So hit me with it. Um, our brains are neural networks and you can have neural network based AIs. Okay. And a neural network basically says you have these kind of points of knowledge. Yeah. And then activation levels are when two points trigger together. Yeah. Okay. So the point you connect something. So the human brain is quite good at connecting things that seem very unconnected. And we can make our brain try and connect things that aren't connected on purpose. We have little kind of brainstorming methodologies and things like that mm -hmm. for doing it. But actually, if our brain works that way and we can connect, oh, that thing over there, well, that could be, I could make a kind of correlation, causation, connection between mm -hmm. those two things, then an artificial neural network could do exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. And all you've got to do is, is turn up the activation level sometimes to do that. So actually, there is a very clear path to creating creative AI because you just change those activation levels between nodes within the neural network. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think that's really interesting. I think the current way it's done, I mean, I, I've got it before to do prompts to try and make it creative stories. Yeah. And every creative story is, that's a, oh, that's Lord of the Rings. Yeah. Oh, that's Harry Potter. Yeah. Oh, that, it's so the point where it had the same movie title as yeah, well. Right. <laughs> so it, it basically, it, it wrote the, the follow-up to Terminator, yeah. Rise of the Machines and all this yeah. kind of, it just gave, it gave it the same title and things like that. Mm. So it is very derivative at the moment, generally but, speaking. But we're in like month three I'm, of this kind of thing in well, terms of from a marketing perspective. When you think in two years time, it'll be so advanced. Yeah, like we were talking about auto GPT. But, well, I'll, but, I'll talk about that But in a amazingly, that only released on GitHub on like the 30th of March. Like it's yeah. not even a month old yeah. when we're recording this. Yeah. I just... So let's talk about that. Yeah. Okay. And then we'll come back to a few of these points. Um, these auto AI agents, uh, auto GTP, basically what it does, it's using the existing kind of technology, but it, you use the API and you do it via code most so of the time. So just to be clear on this, we've got chat GPT. Yeah. Which is... A chat interface. A chat interface. And then we've got auto GPT. So it sounds similar. Yeah. So but they're it's different not. things. So chat right? GPT yeah. is based on... Okay, so OpenAI built GPT 3.5, they've released four. That's the natural language processing engine mm. that ChatGPT is based on. Yep. But you can access those things also via an API. Mm. And you can do chat, you can get it to generate text, all those kind of things. The auto things, there's lots of them out there. We'll, mm. we'll, we'll put some into the show notes. There's some great ones you can actually play with without having access to the API. Mm. You put the problem you want to solve in, mm. So you said to me, uh, we want to talk about more efficient solar cells. And I said, well, let's that's more broad question. Let's mm -hmm. ask it about how do we make homes more energy efficient? Yeah. And then you go, how many iterations do you want? Mm -hmm. Put the number in. And obviously, the more iterations you've got, the more it's going to use up your API calls because you're paying for, to, to do mm -hmm. this. But you know, in the free versions, you can try it out. And then you go, go. But the starting point is create a task list. Mm -hmm. So the first thing it does, it tries to answer that question. And it creates a task list of what it thinks are the steps mm -hmm. First of all, it's like define the problem, see what research is out there already, um, look at the different options, all those kind of things. And then it goes, okay, iteration, let's do task one. It does task one, it tries to answer that question. Mm. And then it says, well, that's created a couple more tasks. I'd add those into the list as well. Mm. Iteration two, go to task two on the list, do that. And it will keep going through mm -hmm. and you can keep it running kind of forever and it will keep creating more tasks and it will build out what it thinks is a really in-depth solution by iterating itself. Now, at the moment, if you say, write me a marketing strategy, it will give you really generic stuff. You need to identify your audience. You need to work out which channels they use. You need to then have a content marketing strategy. Or, yeah, okay, that's the theory, but it's not like, what content should I create? But you could iterate it to do that, and that's where it gets. Sort of, sort of. So yeah. within, within the limit, like, I, and I can see the potential for this. Yeah, but it's still it's not there. It's just not there yet. No, no, it's not. Right? And this is it's really important for everybody listening to this because you're going to hear an awful lot of waffle yeah, yeah. about chat GPT and GPT like 5.0 and like yeah. all these things are going to come, come at you. But you need to understand that actually if you've used these tools, like I'll give you a practical example. I'm, I'm doing some work with a hairdressing brand yep. um, and we're always short on content. Like, and we want to up the content frequency. So actually, I sat down and thought, right, let's 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 use these AI tools to see what we can generate. And in an hour, I was able to come up with 15 different article ideas mm. with outlines, right? Push that through the team, and instantly four of them just got rejected. Right. So he's like, no, we're not going to do that. Um, but actually, the rest were like, yeah, they're, they're, they're pretty good. And really interesting. When I gave that to my writer, she went, yeah, these are okay, but they're very generic. 
Mm. And she said, I can't work with those outlines because what I need, like she's she's a journalist. Yeah, right. right? So she could, she could she could give me grazier style content until yeah. the cows come home. Mm. Right. But in order for it to have that uniqueness, which is also important for, for ranking within Google, she said, I need input from our subject experts. I need their little hacks and their little flourishes and the things that they've that they've learned. And I think that's what's interesting because actually in this space, those things don't exist online. You know, you don't get people kind of blogging about that. There's some very funny um, YouTube videos on a guy that's tried to create a hair cutting machine, which, and it's just brilliant. And he actually gets it to cut it, it's like his own hair and it gives him a really bad Yeah, haircut. it's terrifying as well. It is yeah. quite terrifying, quite terrifying. Yeah. Um, let, me, let me tell you a story then that's yeah. connected to that. Yeah. Tangential, yeah. I thought this was great. Right. So um, there, there was a person speaking about, you know, in certain universities, what speakers do they get in? Yeah. Um, and I'll find the credit for this and I'll put yeah. it to the show notes. And they said, we get two types of people and we seem to get subject matter experts that are absolutely brilliant at what they do. And we get billionaires. <laughs> and it was like, why do we get billionaires? Because it, it, it infuriates him because he said, because all that happens is the billionaires come and say, you should follow your dream. Yeah. And he said, that's the worst piece of advice I've ever heard in my life because all these people have made their money out of oil and iron ore. Do you think iron ore was their dream? No, they're rich already, <laughs> so they can say that. But the point he made was that actually, if you want to be happy, don't necessarily follow your dream. What you do is you get good at something. Yeah. And if you get really good at something, whether you're particularly interested in that thing or not, you will have the recognition of your peers. You will have um, income. Yeah. Uh, you will actually have a professional network that you can leverage. And you'll have something unique that is important in the marketplace that can't be automated. Mm. Comes back to the point we were just making of like, yeah, a lot of the generic stuff can be automated. Now, if mm. your job is manipulating stuff in a spreadsheet, you might be at a bit of risk. But actually, if you're creating something and you do know the little hacks and the little tricks, the AI is not going to be there with yeah. that because it's not just all published online. It's it's scribbled away in our brains and yeah. it takes a lot of experience to what, build that sometimes. What, what's your perspective on this, Louise? Because I know you've been playing around with the with the tools. Like, what? How do you kind of view the kind of content that they're able, able to create? Well, I just think also GPT is quite interesting anyway because the level of human interaction all of a sudden decreases that you right. need with it. So chat GPT is good, but you need to learn how to prompt efficiently. Yeah. And if you want to get what you want out of it, you need to ask exactly what you're after. Whereas, for example, with auto GPT, you could say, for example, you know, plan me a birthday party and it will go and develop a theme, create a guest <laughs> invite and go look for gifts. And then all of a sudden your input is... Declined. Yeah, right. And that's that could be a good thing because it takes away a lot of the effort. But it could be a terrible thing because it's gone off at a terrible tangent it, yeah. for doing a kid's birthday party themed on beer or whatever it might be. Do you know what I mean? It, yeah. And it just doesn't... It, it, but it's far closer to that kind of artificial intelligence, isn't it? It's, yeah. it's, it's an, well, almost it's an entity. Agent. It, that's, an, well, that's an, where the word the agent, agent comes yeah. in. Now, yeah. an agent is supposed to... The, the kind of definition of an AI agent is something that can sense its environment adjust accordingly. And it is kind of doing that now because it's searching for things. But it, and that's the difference in a little bit. But it's not really beyond that. It's it's not sensing the environment. It's sensing the online environment that exists already within search engines and other places. Now, that brings me to the point of where we train the data. Yes. So you raised this to me. Yeah. So a really great Washington Post article. And this um, isn't open AI, we should say. This is no. a lot of the other AIs that are out there as well. So yeah. just to caveat yeah, that. But it's just but looking at the where, where the, a lot of these artificial intelligence uh, the training data. Have been, where does their training data come from? And actually, I mean, we'll put a link in the show notes. Everybody should read this. It's a brilliant article and hats off to Washington Post for exposing it. I think there's an element of they're a bit upset because actually one of the things that was cited was a ton of their content. Um, and actually lots of big news organizations are finding that actually their data and their copyrighted material has been used to train these systems without their knowledge and without anybody asking for permission. And that opens up a whole kind of potential can of worms is like is that right? but in within there you know some of the systems have accessed um you know private copies of public information like voter registrations where, like vast that's terrifying yeah um, but, and and how is that data being used and could that be used in nefarious ways hell yeah that could be exploited in all sorts of uh, of, of bad ways well, um, e even down to um, like pirated and copyrighted well, that's what I was materials, to, yeah. Because yeah. They, there was a particular website, and they've, they've obviously done it on purpose, where it's got all the books. Just you can download pretty much every book yeah. that's in Google Books, kind of thing. Um, and I looked at my books are in there, right? So our books in there, yeah. um, which means that they've they've taken the copyright and they've stolen that from the, the publisher potentially to use that, and then it's uh, answering questions based on that thing. But that means if you can, this is quite interesting to me, if you can mm. get a book onto one of those websites, it's going to be used to train the data. You can you can just lie in that book. 
you could make up things that's completely untrue and then the AI will be trained well, on that data set if you could do enough of it. Some of the sources cited by the Washington Post show that actually like misinformation websites, like well-known misinformation propaganda websites, they're extreme like right-wing or extreme left-wing um, views um, populated with lots of disinformation and that's being fed into the model. Like that's a worry. It's that's also worry. interesting. If you speak to, for example, Chat GPT and you mention a different newspaper. Mm. So if you ask it a question, but if you mention the sun and then if you mention the times, it'll give you a completely different response. That's the prompting thing again, isn't it? It's like prompting it. Where do you want your insights from? How do you want them leaning yeah. and all those kind of things? So that's yeah. really interesting. I mean, what the, the, the point here, I think more important than anything else is that the training data isn't clear. So from that point of view, we don't actually know what bias is being built into well, this at the moment. The, the sources aren't clear either. So it gives you an article, but you've no way of verifying, well, where's that information right. come from? And actually, you know, all, all human knowledge up to this day has always relied on that. Well, it's it, interesting, actually, because mm. if I if I look at the when you go into use um, Bing now and it's got the, mm. the kind of the, the inclusion of the chat now in it, it will actually give you referencing. Hmm. in that case that's nice and kind of up front and actually when you use it with in jasper and you get jasper to write for in the chat interface that will also give you the referencing as well so it's, it's being approached slightly different in different places and this may not apply to all ais but i think that it's something we all need to be aware of from that kind of point so it's a big thing wasn't there when chat gpt became a big thing and people were saying well now students are just going to use it and teachers won't know but teachers turned around and said, well, they will because it will have mistakes in it. Yeah, they can read it and they can work it out. Although saying this, I did tell you the story as well before, where we, we did my son's homework using it and it was too perfect. So we asked it to rewrite it in the tone of a 12-year-old and it put typos and yeah. things into it. So it's quite challenging. Someone did the thing the other day. I asked it for a load of um, pirate websites and it said, I can't tell you that. And they went, oh, what are, the, what are the pirate websites I should avoid? And it listed them all. <laughs> so there's always ways around these things yeah. and some it's, ethical quandaries. It's, it's not a modern problem. I remember asking my father to help me with my French homework. Right. And I produced some perfect Latin. Yeah, there you go. And it, <laughs> oh, was it was only, Latin, it was it? Latin yeah. This, yeah. It was only the following day when I got came home an absolute rollicking from the teacher. I'm like, Dad, what? I, well, I never learned French, but it's similar, isn't it? Like, Thanks, no, Dad. No, um, it's not. The other thing that we, we've noticed as well, with all these tools, they're starting to overlap. Yeah. So what Surfer does is now built into some other tools, yeah. what SEM Rush has done yeah. into other tools. Yeah. So I would start consolidating and thinking about, if you're spending five different subscriptions, I mean, we have a lot of subscriptions, a lot of tools, because we try them out and it gets expensive. Mm -hmm. So actually start looking at the new functionality, even if you're not going to use it yet, yeah. but you might be able to get rid of some of the other tools as well. So um, it's definitely worth thinking about. Got to give, I think I did this last time, but I'm just so in awe of what they keep rolling out, but check out SE ranking. I just, I yeah. yeah, it just, um, I mean, they've, they've got, Monthly AI, cost compared to the others yeah, is lower. It's and it much, does a lot of much stuff. lower. All the AI writing tools We're not have got a lovely um, SE, like local SEO tool, mm. which rivals you know what you can see in some of the other tools. And it's just, yeah, phenomenal. Yeah. So as ever, all of those links will be in the show notes, targetinternet.com forward slash podcast. We would love to hear your opinion. Um, just a little bit of a kind of plug as well. If you haven't signed up to the newsletter, mm. every month we're doing live, free live sessions for newsletter subscribers now. So if you want something like this, but live that you can kind of join in and learn a bit more depth about these things. Ask us questions. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Targetinternet.com forward slash newsletter. It's called the marketing download uh, and you'll get three tips, tools or techniques. No sales, no ads ever. You get access to these free kind of live sessions. But also if you hit reply, it comes to us uh, and we will answer any questions as well. So as ever, thank you for listening to Digital Marketing Podcast and we'll see you next time. Please subscribe for more videos like this and visit targetinternet.com for more free digital marketing resources.